Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to the imagery category. I'm super excited to be with Susan Woods. She's the CEO of Vita. Susan, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. I, I'm very excited. Very excited, Kyle. Nice to meet you and nice to, uh, nice to uh, talk to you. Thank you. I, uh, for, for context for the audience, uh, why we're doing this interview, we looked at well over 242 companies within what we call the imagery category. And one of the companies that really stood out to us was Vita. So that they're doing some really impressive things within that uh, chess CT analysis. And they have built out a feature set that's really impressive. So we're going to jump into that a little bit today and uh, some of those uh, questions of breaking down those features and, you know, why did you build the platform, et cetera. But before we even jump into those questions, uh, you have a great video you're going to show us. that It's a, a good visual for the audience to have a baseline understanding of who is Vita. So we'll jump to that and then go into questions. Sound good? Sounds terrific. First, one of the things I'm just curious right off the bat, Susan, before I even jump into product questions, I'm curious, is there a backstory behind why you started Vita? So Vita was founded, you know, on the basic principle that patients are, are people with or at risk of lung disease. There was better value to be provided by them um, using imaging. So it was like an, an integrative or a multidisciplined approach to manage the patient with or at risk of pulmonary disease using imaging. And you know, one of the, the big, I think, issues now, even with a lot of intelligence companies, is that you know, the meshing of the data science component and the clinical component, they're often disconnected. And that founding principle of Vita was to connect those two pieces to solve a clinical problem using intelligence and not having an AI solution that kind of backs into a, a clinical problem. Interesting. Really interesting. Well, I'm jumping into the, the product itself um, because at, at a you know baseline, you know we have a we have a AI powered chest CT analysis solution, and um, I'm, I'm just curious just so the audience has a better understanding of when would a provider would use your solution? What is the setting typically? What are these types of patients that uh, would have this? Why, you know, CT imagery? So, you know, just as a kind of an understanding or a foundation for AI and intelligence, what Vita's piece of that or the or focus is lung and respiratory care. And so we scale our solution across the different components of that care. So to have a more comprehensive approach. So providers would use that, use our solution uh, to um, find disease, to detect disease and the screening solution, to diagnose disease. So, so we found something, now what is it? Like a definitive diagnosis to be able to track that disease over time? Is it progressing or regressing? And then once it's definitive, definitively diagnosed, to determine which therapeutic is the best or which, which, uh, which therapeutic is the best for that, for that patient. You know, which therapy, which patient, and which time to use it. So th those are the, the main components of, or across the care spectrum which we use Vita. And then of course that patient post-therapy needs to be monitored so we can look afterwards to see whether or not that patient response was effective. Interesting. So it's a big focus on the respiratory diseases. Yeah, that's, that's the foundation and that's the depth of our solution is really understanding respiratory disease and those mm -hmm. disease workflows in a deep clinical way. And, and, and maybe uh, either um, just for context, I'm, I'm curious, why is, 
CT scans primarily used for chest analysis. Why isn't MRI or, you know, uh, X-ray or or uh, ultrasound as common? Yeah. Well, there I should say there is a lot of X-ray, and CT is a, a form of X-ray. There's mm -hmm. a couple reasons. One is that in CT is sort of the heartbeat of the patient with respiratory disease. Uh, there's the rationale for that is as a, compared to x-ray, projection x-ray, there's just, you get a lot higher resolution and the new CT scanners have managed to reduce that dose to the point you can get very, very high resolution of imagery at a, at a very low dose. When you compare it to modalities like ultrasound or, or MR, let's take MR, there's, there's some physics there. I mean, M MR likes things to be homogeneous, like water, the same thing. The lung is, is air and water. So at that air tissue interface, you generally don't get as high resolution imaging. So CT is, is really a, a, an exceptional, um, exceptional modality for an, an analyzing lung disease. Interesting. Well, and, um, you know, what, uh, what, before VDOT, what was the traditional method providers would use when they would take a CT scan and how would they analyze it without your solution? Like what was the, what is the traditional method yeah, that exists so, today? Yeah, the, the, well, the way that a, a lot of CT exams get read now by radiologists, just their, uh, their eyeballs, right? So it's, a, it's, while they're very extraordinarily well-trained, it still isn't a, a subjective evaluation. So we don't use our solution in lieu of that radiology read. We use kind of a very objective, standardized way of evaluating that image to, um, to coordinate with the radiologist's normal read. So they have an objective review of that image as well as their own, um, their own base and, and subjective or visual read. And the combination of the two gives, tend to give a better outcome, a better outlook. Interesting. It makes sense. And I feel like, uh, especially for the uh, imagery category as a whole, it's trying to make that shift from how do you go from uh, uh, the subjective or what you talked about, just eyeballing, uh, uh, existing CT scans to now actually a more formalized standard method. Yeah, I think that the yeah. issue there is is variability. We have to re remember that, you know, still the, the highest variability in the health system are still people. You know, that doesn't mean they're not well trained. It's just that that there's a, there people will read and they'll diagnose at you know different times of day, uh, whether or not they're getting you know, interrupted by a phone call or someone else coming in. And mm -hmm. computational reads are, can be a baseline. It's very objective, it's repeatable, and that's that those two systems complement each other for, for uh, better performance. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about the features too, what makes your Vita really impressive because you've, uh, from my understanding, you actually have uh, a patent pending method for airway visualizations, and that's you're trying to automatically quantify lung density. I'm just curious, can you talk a little bit more about this patent itself and why is that important? Yeah, so one of the things, what we're trying to use intelligence, AI, if you will, to modernize the practice of managing people with or at risk of, of lung disease. And part of that is improving outcomes, but part of it is to drive efficiencies in, in the system. Now, the airways and the pulmonary vascular, for example, are very complex branching structures. So it's, it's difficult to read them and to diagnose them in your traditional reading planes. So what we've done with our, our topographic NPR solution is consolidated that read into uh, two or three unique imaging planes where you can see most of the airways in that tree in a single image or a single, uh, a single plane. 
And that has been shown to reduce the reading time on uh, reading those images by as much as 35%. So a radiologist in a busy practice can have AI-driven workflow efficiencies that will reduce the reading time and with that reduction, not compromise the accuracy of that read, and in fact, heighten the accuracy of the read. Impressive. I mean, how, do you, how do you go about building something like this, a feature uh, in, in this way? I mean, where does, where does the knowledge set come from? Where does the data set come from to build out a visualization tool? Where does the skill set come from? I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, so the, a great question. I think one of the uniquenesses of Vita is that we've been building a database of disease-specific evidence for over a decade. And when I mean by disease-specific evidence, it's, it's, it's multiple lung diseases and their comorbidity. So a patient with emphysema may also have a lung cancer, that's a comorbidity. So we have those patients that we've been able to follow over time, right? For their natural course of the disease, or their response to different therapeutics. And those, that's the kind of the knowledge base that we have. And then we can draw from those unique measures that we have on these patients at these different time points, at these different states. And we've been able to mine that data for information. We get most of it on, from large um, um, uh, studies. We put, um, over 70 clinical trials through the Vita platform to validate it. So that's what I was talking about at the beginning. It's, it's the, the marriage of the clinical issue with the data science. That's what makes Vita unique, is that we have all of those data that we've been tracking information. So the, the measurements that we have are validated to have a clinical implication, whether it's this disease, this disease that's growing, this patient's responded, we can find a way to measure that with our, the insights we draw from that, that unique database. Interesting. Impressive. I mean, there's, I feel like that's a, that's a, a hard, that, that route alone, building up that data set is already difficult in the first place. And then being able to take that, draw insights from it and actually build out a platform and integrate into workflows is, even harder. I think that's one of the, the you know, the data science of, for deep learning and AI algorithms has definitely, certainly advanced um, over, you know, the last decades or so. But the, I think that the, the, some of the hurdles to get these solutions into the marketplace have been not just data. I mean, data is easy, right? It's the curation of that data, you know, the be able to to to, um, um, to have a naming convention on those data to define what your ground truth is. Those are the pieces that I think that have been missing to take those that that those data science implications and, and integrate it into uh, a clinically a clinical solution. Interesting. Well, I, I, I'm curious to get your perspective on this because you have a lot of cool features. You have everything from the airway mapping to lung volume analysis. You've done predictive post-operative lung function. I mean, there's, there's a handful of things you guys do, and it's a pretty, pretty in-depth with, with chest CT analysis. Uh, I, you know, when you start to look at companies that are using AI-assisted solutions and building that out into a workflow, I mean, how... How far do you go with providing um, assistance to the provider radiologist? Is the goal here purely to provide just quality data for them to make the decision? Or do you expect, or are you already getting into a phase where you're recommending the next action steps for the radiologist or provider? Uh, maybe not necessarily a diagnosis, but uh, how far are you going with the well, assistance? I Look, in our, our quest to modernize respiratory care is to make a much more informed process. So what the information we're providing now to a clinician or to a radiologist that would provide um, a, a better product to that clinician would be to, to give, you know, 
information that would help him or her make the best decision about that patient, in addition to their own knowledge base that they have, you know, the judgment of, of the clinician. So we're, we are augmenting their decision-making process. That's where we are now. There are some things that in future we will be able to automate, but the best path now is to, to provide the best information delivered in a, with concision and in a way that's easily consumed by that clinician so they don't have to wait a lot of time to get information. And if we can, if we can apply all those things more informed information, more, more information delivered with concision and delivered within their normal workflow so that they don't have to add time to get this information. I think that those are, are three grand things that we can provide, um, pr provide the, the stakeholders of that lung patient. Interesting. No, it makes sense because the jump that you're making is going from a uh, provider eyeballing you know, imagery to now a standardized flow that provides quality data that is almost precise, exactly precise, and with a uh, um, variety of different measurements that supports. Yeah. Well, I think the other making. thing that I would mention is that it's not just the visual CT data. A lot of the functional data, like does that is more as standard for a pulmonary patient, is like a pulmonary function test, you know, where you that's kind of the standard of care where you kind of blow into a tube and see how much air you can dispel in a certain amount of time. And that, again, it's, it's, it's a measurement, but it's highly variable. And, you know, it's, it's not something that gives a lot of precision on, you know, it might say the patient has a problem, but not what it is and, and where it is, right? C, CT will give you, okay, it looks like it's there, but it, this gives, this is your disease, this is that disease subtype, this is how it's progressing over time, and the unique qualities of that patient, now we can recommend the next course of therapeutic action because we know the likelihood that that patient will respond to therapy A, B, or C. That's the value, that amongst the value, but that's one of the key values that we can, we can provide with this more quantitative approach makes sense well and it's not just i i, I want to go back to the point that you mentioned earlier with the things that the work that you're doing in uh clinical trials because you uh are not just simply providing a software uh software solution and you know handing that off to radiologists you're pretty active pretty aggressive with the uh, supporting yeah. clinical trials could you talk a little bit more about some of the services or support that you Provide. Yeah, and so again, because our focus is an in depth in um, pulmonary care, we can also apply these uh, these predictive uh, and precise biomarkers for the evaluation of new therapeutics. So, in a clinical trial setting, and I'll kind of focus more on pharmaceutical trials, but it would also apply to device trials. We can select, we can help that, that sponsor, that pharmaceutical company, better select the type of patients for that trial. And we can have a quality control way of providing a precision endpoint. So again, if you compare what we can do with CT is finding, using a precision endpoint, and you compare that to say a pulmonary function test, you can get a signal or a, or a response with that outcome measure and sometimes with you know, 95% fewer patients or fewer subjects in that trial. So in, a, you know, in an earlier phase trial, you can find out, determine whether that, that compound, you know, whether or not it's gonna work, you know, an earlier go, no, go decision. But the, over the course of that, of that trial, you can reduce the time, you can reduce the number of subjects in the trial and therefore reduce the cost of that trial tremendously. And one of the, the, the probably not so well-known things about, um, about clinical trials is the respiratory trial, because the current endpoints they're using are so subjective and so variable, they're one of the most expensive and you know, have the longest timelines to get that drug to market. You know, and that's a, that's a very big problem for, these, for the respiratory drugs. So we look to 
use precision time points, uh, endpoints, sorry, and reduce that timeline and therefore reduce the cost to get that uh, pharmaceutical to market. Really impressive. Exciting. Um, and and once, once they are to market, we can then use those clinical measures to determine that therapy when the patient should get it because we, can, we know what the, the unique biomarkers are for response. You know, so we know when, that, when the, that drug is available for, for patient use, for clinical use, we now have an underlying you know, CT-based biomarkers to determine you know, what subtype of patients are going to respond to that drug and which won't. You know, the, the, the number one asthma drug on the market only has 11% response, you know? So of all the patients with asthma, you get, you get, you get an asthma drug and you know, there's you know, a one in 10 respond. Well, that's not good. We wanna find those 11% you know, of the patients that will respond and give them that drug not, and not have to worry about giving the wrong drug to the 89 um, patients that, that wouldn't respond. So that's the idea of, of working within clinical trials. It's not two independent businesses. You know, one leads to the validation of the other. Wow. I didn't know that. 11%. Holy cow. Isn't that something? I mean, it, it's um, Eric Topol's book on deep medicine. It's like the first chapter. And it's, wow. it's even for those of us that like you and I have been in this business, I read it and I was like, really? 11 yeah. percent that, that's amazing huh well it's it's impressive now to have a solution like yours being able to provide at least a little bit more visibility and whether or not you know applications like this or drugs are actually beneficial or not and i think that's it's a huge step forward I, I'm, I'm i'm curious though because we we talked um you know a lot about how your platform has been has the ability to not only identify a problem, where it exists, even now when you should, you know, especially clinicians or, um, or providers should step forward and, and provide a, a, a therapy. Uh, are there any form of limitations or are you afraid of any liabilities or risks associated with maybe getting a measurement wrong or, you know, uh, do you sense that providers may or be uh, concerned in, in any way that uh, using a, a tool or solution that, uh, um, could, yeah, could I, pose a risk? I, I think we should always be concerned that we're giving the right information, mm. but I, the way that we mitigate that risk is through a really comprehensive approach to validating those solutions. So what I'd be concerned about, and, and I think appropriately so, the, the, um, the clinical community wants the once AI solutions to be validated. They want to know that the metrics we have have some representation of a clinical condition or a, a clinical finding, right? That is fair enough. And, and that's what we should be doing because, you know, we're not injecting this, you know, the solution in an automobile engine. I mean, this is a person and we want to make sure we get it right. Having said that, the, the way that, that Vita, I think, separates ourselves from other AI solutions is a very comprehensive clinical trial and validation process. It's a highly co quality control process. We do this through, through large scale academic trials to validate our, our biomarkers. And we use those validated biomarkers through um, therapeutic trials. So all of it is a, um, a clinical validation process. So it has um, it has a quality control to it. So it's not just an algorithm. That's what I mean by the, the first piece is that the data science is great, right? And the AI solutions are great. But if you don't have it validated clinically, then that's going to be a chasm for a, a, a clinical use case. And, and I think it's a fair chasm. I think it has to be something that's validated for clinical use and that it's passed, you know, some uh, level of quality. Yeah, no, I think that's that's what made uh, your platform impressive is you've made sure that you've branched the two. You've brought, you know, great data solutions, but in a, in a, in a sense that uh, matches real clinical trials and making sure that uh, your, your approach is, uh, 
uh, built for the healthcare ecosystem. Because this, that's, I feel as though that's generally the biggest challenges within uh, most of the software industry. Being disruptive is a, is a great terminology, but at the same time, uh, you have to be very careful. There's regulations, there's patients at uh, lives at risk. There are uh, a, a lot of- Highly regulated industry, <laughs> that's for sure. A lot of a lot of hurdles to jump through, and it's it's impressive uh, what you've accomplished, especially for the variety of different respiratory disease states that, uh, that you guys look at. Um, what is what does that implementation process look like? Like, how do you work directly with either providers, radiologists, or even in the clinical trial settings? Yeah. So the way we we work with the clinical community is really we integrate with their normal reading solutions. So we'll integrate with, um, uh, seamlessly integrate with their PACS system. It's because that's where they'll normally do their reading or their centralized you know, uh, cockpit to do their evaluation. So we integrate seamlessly with that. We do it through partners. We partner with Intellirad. We partner with Nuance Communications. We partner with IBM Watson. And all of those, um, all of those solutions are, are uh, deeply integrated into that workflow. As well as, you know, we can we can then take that those outputs and put them and integrate them more directly in the EMR. So it's the information that we provide is provided where people make their decisions. You know, so they don't have to go elsewhere to find information. And I think that's the critical piece of it, is that it, it has to be an integrative solution. It has to be something that's streamlined with a normal workflow or enhances that workflow. It certainly can't, um, with the, the practice of medicine now and certainly the practice of, of radiology in a busy practice, we would have to have a full and streamlined integration. And I think that that helps, certainly helps the, the onboarding process too, because we're integrating with a solution that they already have. And so they've are that that's that's all the security risk associated with, you know, their your nuance platform, for example, where your um, radiologists would do most radiologists would do their read, that they've already gone through that. So they can onboard um, a solution like Vita much more, much more easily with with a um, you know, reduced hurdles. And that I think that helps all people. It helps it helps us because the onboarding process is um, is shorter. It helps Nuance because they can put more information uh, and make that available to their customers. It actually helps the customer because you don't want to go to each individual vendor and have a new contract to go up. You want a central contract with you know with one provider, and we can integrate into that that same. Provider. So that's, I think it helps everyone. It's sort of like the triple win. Well, I think that's a huge, uh, both competitive advantage, but uh, also one of the things that made uh, Evita stand out is making it uh, simple without having to change the workflow of the end user and, and, and making that process seamless of both integrating into their existing workflow, but uh, being able to not change your day to day tasks, not have to switch to different types of machines, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's really great that you have that, uh, that ability. Um, taking a step back, you, in you, your last answer may have already answered my next question, but uh, uh, you know, we, healthcare software notoriously is having, has the really long sales cycles. It's very difficult yep. to sell the providers. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, how do you experience this? And I mean, how do you manage? Uh, the, the challenge of having pretty long sales cycles? Well, I, I, part of it, I think I'll just maybe repeat it in a different way. By integrating and, and partnering with the solutions that those, those customers and those providers already have, I, again, I think it makes it easier on, on us and it makes it easier on the provider because they don't have to onboard as many new solutions. You don't want to onboard 50 AI solutions because there's a lot of places that you can integrate AI in your normal practice, right? So you want to have some centralized and more streamlined way to do that. 
So by, by choosing really good partnerships, that helps us onboard these solutions. We also go direct. I mean, I don't want to take that out of, um, out of the equation, which again would be that longer sales cycle. But we're able to go into a health system and say, okay, you have this platform, A, B, and C, we can integrate with those all, all three of those platforms because that's where you make your decisions. So we have those integrations where they're already sitting down and, and deciding on critical pieces of information for that patient's that patient management. Interesting. Well, um, and, and uh, you know, one of the follow-up questions that I have is, you know, the big elephant in the room, the, the pandemic. Uh, I'm just curious, how has the pandemic affected your company and, and does that change uh, how you do business? So I, I think the pandemic has affected everyone, obviously, and it's a, certainly affected, it's certainly affected health systems. You know, it just at, in, in initially, health systems closed down to external sales. And so that was maybe a tough time to go in and, and sell a new solution. But they have, um, you know, found ways, different ways and more unique ways like we all have to live in this environment. And so that was, it was shorter lived than I think a lot of us um, thought, you know, so the, the, the ability to onboard and to engage these health systems was a shorter period of time than we had originally, you know, accounted for. I think the unique thing about Vita in this pandemic is that, you know, there's, it is a, a respiratory pandemic. It's, there's other issues associated with COVID-19 that aren't necessarily uh, have respiratory implications, but there's no doubt that it is, you know, progressive respiratory failure is still the number one cause of death for these patients. Okay? And patients with underlying chronic pulmonary conditions like a COPD are as much as six times more likely to have a poorer outcome than if they were healthy patients. So those patients with that underlying disease are the, the ones that we've been analyzing for over a decade. So we know that risk factor associated with those patients. And that's a really important input into the management of, of the patient with COVID-19. At least you know that they're gonna be more at risk and you can monitor, potentially monitor those patients um, more, more um, um, have greater scrutiny on those. I, I think that for, so as a company, because we've always um, had a focus on lung and respiratory care, it's certainly given us, um, it's certainly given us a more, um, I would say, visibility. And that's good because, you know, regardless of COVID-19, the company has been very passionate about managing patients and giving them opportunities with or at risk of pulmonary disease. Now we think that our, you know, our work is even more valuable because the patients with COVID-19 are now our patients and we can help manage them. We can help manage them through disease, that, that disease process and help, help triage them to potentially a greater outcome. But we can also highlight those patients or some of the patients that are at higher risk for those poorer outcomes. The other very likely event that will come out of, of COVID-19 is that the patients that have recovered will likely have a higher susceptibility to the disease in the future. So they'll have to be monitored over time. The patients with a pneumonia, for example, um, tend to have a higher likelihood of getting a, a, a fibrosis, another type of disease later in life. So that's a, the kind of monitoring. Now that patient's more at risk for a different type of disease. So we'll have to continue to look at that. Interesting. No, it, it, it seems as though uh, your, your platform would be uh, very important in a time like this, being actually 
being aware of not only what are patients at risk, but also, you know, what happens to uh, the patients that do recover. Because uh, as you mentioned that um, uh, it's, some don't recover 100%. And uh, uh, having a tool and a solution like Vita, I think will really help a lot of those individuals manage their health going forward in a much better way than what especially traditionally has been. So it's, it's, it's great that uh, you exist in a time like this. Uh, um, I, I, I won't say it's a silver, I, we don't look at this as a silver lining, but we're certainly happy that with the spade work we've done in understanding these patients and how that, 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 you know, that parallel evidence can certainly help this new co cohort of patients. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I do think uh, generally the for the most conversations that we had with a lot of founders and even investors within healthcare is that the the pandemic kind of uh, highlighted a lot of bottlenecks uh, and then really pushed forward the need to have tools and solutions that standardize a lot of process or at least bring better quality data. Um, uh, and it, it and unfortunately we had to have a pandemic to get to you know, shine a flashlight on some of those bottlenecks, but uh, oh, and uh, that, fragmentation of the healthcare system. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but overall, it's I think it's going to be a positive push forward. Um, the maybe taking giving you a philosophical uh, philosophical question. I'm curious, what do you what do you think is the future of imagery services, and sp maybe more specific. Uh, um, uh, you know, lung and, and CT uh, chest analysis. I mean, and what do you see that people don't? So, you know, we, I think that at, at Vita, we're, we've always looked at to really be able to solve a case for AI and to make a, a clinical impact. You have to have an in-depth understanding of that clinical problem that you're solving. So we go, that's why, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for AI and, and it, it's, it's, there's a, a shortage of physicians. There's, you know, physicians spending their time on things that, that is more conducive to computation. So all of, I think that is all a component of the value proposition. But to really be able to solve these clinical problems, you have to have a, a, a understanding of the depth of those the uh, the clinical issues, a depth of understanding of the disease state and the comorbidities associated with that disease, and then you can apply AI for a, a, a you can apply data science and intelligence to a clinical problem and not have data science sort of back end to try to say, okay, I'm gonna solve, you're gonna use this tool or, you know, to solve this clinical problem. And I think that's a difference in approach. So that's, I think that that's, you know, fundamental to all of, of AI. I think the other component of this is that it has to be integrated into a clinical workflow and it can, has the ability certainly to enhance clinical workflow in its use case. So it's better information, it's a more informed process, but it's also, it streamlines care coordination and it drives efficiencies. You can use information in ways that can be in lieu of a, a more expensive test and lieu of a more expensive procedure. You can use information to determine whether or not they should be getting that procedure at all whether or not they should be getting that asthma drug at all. That's the information that AI can provide. Interesting. Well, with that, Susan, this was fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Before I close out, is there anything that you wanted to you know, ask the audience, announce anything that you would uh, like to share? You mean a, a pending IPO or something of, of that nature? <laughs> uh, open to customers, fundraising, hiring, anything. Um, well, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Um, we have a, we've recently, uh, Vita did receive a fundraise earlier this year. Um, one of the, folk, um, the focal points of that fundraise was to expand our solution into clinical practice. 
We have had a terrific um, uh, hiring uh, uh, cycle in the last six months, we have gotten a fantastic extension to our group, and we've had an, a, a, a fantastic um, inroads into uh, clinical practice. So we're very excited to be sort of running um, full speed ahead and to really hit in our goals. And, and that really to, speaks of, to a number of things. A lot of the, the components you talked about at the beginning, this is the time for these types of solutions. We're in the midst of, among other things, a, 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 pan, a pandemic that, could, that we can help solve these problems. But fundamentally, patients with a risk of lung disease need better options and they need more informed approaches. And there is just a, a very large opportunity in lung health to be able to apply these solutions to it and for the better outcomes of the patient. Wonderful. Well, with that, Susan, thank you so much for taking the time okay. to do this. And again, for the audience, why we had oh, this welcome. interview. <laughs> yeah, and why we had this interview. I mean, we thought Vita was one of the best companies within the imagery category as a whole. And the reasons why we get to learn a little bit more in depth, uh, the, the background of this. And, and the biggest reason, and one of the things that was most important that stood out to us as well is the fact that you have a clinical you have that in-depth knowledge about respiratory disease. You understand how to take that and use tools like artificial intelligence and a lot of different visualization features and big data sets and data science to pull out insights that's really impactful for providers that to help radiologists, clinicians, et cetera, uh, even clinical trials to make much better decisions. And not only that, you've taken such a, you've built a great tool that leverages these insights and you make it seamless to plug into the existing workflows of providers. And now, probably one of the most important aspects of everything is that uh, now more than ever, we need a solution like Vita because you're gonna be at the forefront of helping a lot of those you know, individuals that are having to go through the pandemic and having to deal with the respiratory disease. And now we're going to have to live with that after maybe experiencing it for the rest of their life. And so uh, this was really impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm super happy you took the time to do this, and I'm super happy that we could announce that Vita is a, a really impressive solution. So thank you so much, Susan, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. It's terrific to talk to you.